Hello, 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 and welcome to yet another episode of the Conversation Capital. As always, I always enter with saying thank you, thank you so much for all the love you guys continue to show us. The TCC family keeps growing. Continue to like, share, and subscribe. If you're catching us on any other platform, be it Instagram, TikTok, remember that our main podcast is on YouTube. So make sure that you go to YouTube and you subscribe. As always, the voice of reason, Bonga Bueta. Hi, girl. Hello. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Ach, I'm awesome. Thank you. How's Asante? Asante is growing. Oh, She's good. That's amazing. Imagine. Yeah, she'll be in the background. Yes. Very soon she'll be in the background. And then I've got a very special guest. I'm excited to have her. And and I think, maybe let me introduce her and then explain how we got to the topic. Hi, UNA, Mare. How are you doing? Hello. I've been calling her Joe my whole life. And now I'm like, oh, your name's actually UNA, and is that how it's spelled? <laughs> your whole life, and then that last yes. year, but your whole life. Yeah, my whole life, I mean, it's a bit dramatic, but... Thank you so much for joining us, and you're not joining us necessarily in that capacity. Um, um, however, we're chatting all things to do with, like, looking at grief in an alternative way. Mm-hmm. So an alternative, you know, there's so much anxiety that we carry around grief, and so an alternative form. The other day I was on WhatsApp where I actually fish out many of the topics that we have for TCC with my immediate WhatsApp people, I ask them questions and we look at, you know, different type of topics. And one of the questions I asked recently was, what's your biggest fear? And then the fear of death came up quite a bit. Mm. And, and I said, this one also has me in a chokehold. The first person to say it was, uh, my mom dying is a big fear for me. Mm. And I know, as I say it now, but there's so many people that can relate. Yes. Where, when you think about it, you immediately like get anxiety mm. around it or your, your parent or your sibling the thought of it alone can bring about so much anxiety, but the fact is it's going to happen, Yeah, you know? And so that's what we're chatting about today, an alternative way of looking at grief. But let's start off with who are you? What do you do? Where are you from? Ooh, such a big question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm UNA, Mare, but I go by Joe, and I'm a master's student and neuroscientist by heart and training. Um, sometimes it feels like a bit of a imposter syndrome vibe when I say I'm a neuroscientist Mm. because I I don't get to play with brains as often as I'd like. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's that's me, but I'm also someone who is very connected to the outdoors. I love music. Making playlists is a love language of mine. Mm. So I'm I'm very connected to things ceremonial, Mm. ritualistic, natural, communal. I love socializing. I love networking, meeting people. So... Mm. I love the fact that you touched on imposter syndrome. It's something that we've talked about here mm. on the Conversation Capsule. And it's true. You never get used to, even me, when like I, I think I can introduce myself as many things, but never the scientist half of me. Right? Because you never fully feel like, yeah. you know, you could like, it just it just never happens. So as soon as you said it, I'm like, don't worry, girl. This is Conversation Capital. <laughs> we don't deal with imposter syndrome here. Like, it's nothing you ever have to worry yeah. about. You know, yeah. At the end of the day, we're just having chats. And... Just, you know, in my engagements with you, it, like I said, it's not in that capacity that we've invited you, just somebody who's enlightened and loves to share different perspectives. Um, I remember the, the first time where you really caught my eye because we worked together, um, there was that whole little thing, um, I don't even know if I should share it, but you were basically just standing up against, like, you know, pe- somebody not being PC, politically correct mm. in a certain <laughs> thing. And in those settings, you know, it's very like, yo, this person must be super bold. And then I was very drawn to you from then. And I'm like, I really want to get to know this girl and the person that she is. That being said, give us your perspective on grief. Because I know that this is something that I was like, hmm, this is an interesting way to look at it. And maybe if I looked at it like this, I wouldn't carry so much anxiety around it. Mm. Mm. You know, grieving is going to happen. You're probably grieving something right now. Mm. Sure. You know, I definitely am. I, my, my cat recently got ill. Um, mm. He started mm. experiencing some seizures. And he's 17, so he's by no means a young boy, but the Friday night he was still playing and eating as normal, and now you're faced with this reality of I might need to say goodbye to my best friend <clears throat> of 17 years. Yeah, mm. yeah. And so you think grief isn't going to come when you least expect it, but it does, and it continues sure. to. Mm. And so now he's doing better, and he's on anticonvulsant meds, but... For the past week, I've been facing this reality that I I do have to start saying goodbye constantly. And I think grief is as much of our life Mm. as celebration is. And it's like, Mm. it's the other side of it. We grieve because we love Mm. and because we celebrate. Otherwise, there's nothing heavy to to say goodbye to. Sure. 
Yeah. So there's actually a beauty in grieving because it means that you once had the opportunity to love. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so, you know, looking at like just that, the anxiety you're speaking of, you kept the anxiety of, of like, you know, having this parent. And I remember when we spoke earlier, you said, um, you mentioned the French word. Oh. For Le petit mort. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what that means, and then looking at it like the ultimate orgasm, yeah? Yeah, so, uh. so le petit mort is to describe an orgasm as the small death. Yes. And I really, this is not a common view, and it might seem to reduce death, which I by no means mean to do. Mourning is hectic and intense, but grieving death, it is the ultimate orgasm, the great orgasm, the thing that returns you. I don't know what certain people might believe but I think for a lot of people grief and death is not just the end of life but something better you go to a better place you go to heaven or you reincarnate and there is that continuation of what your earthly existence gave you and so when we grieve and we lose people and they die they're free the world is full of suffering and so to die is ultimately the greatest greatest orgasm, the greatest freedom. Yeah. And what prompted or what created this shift in how you view grieving? Loss. Hmm? Loss, yeah. My mom's first partner, we had her in my life since since I was about 10. And she struggled with bipolar disorder. And one day you get the call and she's no longer with us. And you are faced with it's not my mom, but it's it's my first other mother. Mm. And that grief took hold of me for years. It changed the person who I was. I became a shell of myself. Sure. And it's only when I went to an eight-hour meditation and I felt this harmonious chant. I thought it was just eight hours silent. I could sit for eight hours and be silent, but we were chanting. And in this chanting... Chanting in silence? No. Oh. So I thought it was silence. I thought it was an eight hour silent. Yes, yes, okay. Let's Um, sit and meditate. Yes, yes, yes. But we were chanting this scripture called the Japji. And it speaks about the continuation of life and death and the cycle of creation and demise and recreation. Uh And to have 30 or 40 people chanting in a room for eight hours, it's cosmic, it's transcendence. And in that moment, I felt so connected to Ulla for the first time since her death in such a profound way. Mm-hmm. I had had dreams about her. Uh, you know, you, th- you get a text and you think maybe it's her. You mm-hmm. struggle to come to terms with the reality. Mm-hmm. And then you realize this person isn't gone. They've transcended. You sure. can still speak to them. Yes. You can write them poems. You can play them songs. You can send them emails. I would mm-hmm. often just send her a quick little text. I knew she would never read it in this realm, but that message was being delivered. It was love being sent outward. And it's only because I loved so deeply that I could grieve so deeply. Mm. You know, I used to battle with, um, I don't know, I, with the fact that I don't cry at death. Né? And then I just came to the realization that I think in my head, I've realized that it's another stage. Mm. So like you say, I haven't really lost that person. I've lost them in the physical form, but I haven't lost them. Mm. Like I can still speak to them and they've just transcended to the next life cycle or, or part mm. of the life cycle. So I think grieving, yes, it's, it's substantiated and the sadness is of course accepted and it's okay. But I think if you think about it as the next stage of life, some people may say it's a bit cold to view it like that. However, I think it's a bit more liberating because it's not the end of the person's life. It's just the end in the physical Mm, form. mm. So then I I think that made sense to me in terms of why I do not cry at the death of people. It's sad, but I don't cry or feel um, like I've lost someone hugely. I may have lost them in the physical sense but not in the spiritual realm or other realms. I can still speak to these people. And I think we limit ourselves. This is not to minimize, like you said, death Mm. or so forth. Mm. However, to say there's different ways we can look at it. Of course, practically, there are some things that you will not be able to experience, Mm. but there are other things that you'll be able to experience. Like people, I don't know if it's because we're making... We're trying to make ourselves feel better. But some people say that they actually feel the presence of the person they've lost 
mm-hmm. or they, they can see um, maybe a light flick and um, it reminds them of that person. Mm-hmm. And there's something that reminds them that the person is around them. Mm-hmm. So I d- can definitely relate in viewing grief as part of the life cycle mm-hmm. and not necessarily the end of someone's life, maybe in the physical Really. Mm. I think just to throw a span in the works of a different perspective, um, I'm, I've just always been somebody who definitely knows in what is seen and believes in what is unseen in the sense that I, I acknowledge that it's not matter, matter of factual. Like, um, so I go to church and whatever, but I, I never speak of anything as a matter of fact. I'm, I'm aware that I, I do not see it. But this is what, and this is for me the, a, a clear cut distinction because between believing in something, mm-hmm. you need faith mm-hmm. to believe in mm-hmm. something versus knowing something, right? Yeah. I know my hands are here, I see them, they they exist, versus believing in a God, believing in an afterlife, and 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 so be, because of that like uh, perspective, I've, I've I've never been very clear cut as in heaven is there, yeah, you know, and maybe I don't know my pastor's watching saying oh, she <laughs> don't believe in heaven, I don't know, <laughs> you know, but I've never been that person, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, okay, there's a belief system and this is one of the perspectives to look at. The afterlife is a perspective. Um, but I remember the one time where I felt I can see how this can help somebody look at it differently was there's a movie called Collateral Beauty. Hmm. And Will Smith is the main character and he loses his wife. I think, I don't remember. But it's, it's around grieving and death. And, and I was like, ooh. And, and, and I remember he gets very angry at first when this person is trying to teach him to look at the collateral beauty of what he's going through. So collateral being like beauty that runs hand in hand with this terrible thing that you're experiencing. Mm. In life, generally, there is collateral beauty. Mm. When you lose a job, it's an opportunity for something else mm. to start. That is the collateral beauty. Mm. But in that moment, when somebody says collateral beauty after you lost your job, it sounds insensitive. Yes. Yeah. Right? And so, and so this is when I, I, you know, through this movie, it was such a beautiful, brilliant movie, and beautiful movie, you guys should go check it out, where I learned that, you know, these things run hand in hand. And, and then w- one of the things uh, that come up is when they speak of, like, you know, to understand death, you must look at life. Mm. I'm actually thinking I could have not been in this movie. It might have been, <laughs> but I'm not too sure. So to look, understand death, you should look at life. And then the lady speaks of an infant in the mother's womb, right? So an infant is sitting in a mother's uterus. And that is the world that they know. Mm. From the moment they're conceived, that is what they know. They know this darkness. They live alone. And the only thing that they know is that I'm growing too big for the space. Because at first they had a lot of space to shift around. And now the space keeps getting smaller and smaller. And so something's going to happen. Mm. The infant knows something is going to happen. It's like us aging. Mm. We can see mm. our bodies deteriorating and growing old. So something is going to happen. right? And because we've seen this and we understand you know, that life does happen. Uh, we know that this thing is going to happen. And so then it explains that this baby then dies when they're giving birth to this world that they know, yes. this uterus that they know. And then they enter into a like new a new world. space and a new... And and since then, I've always had this like overwhelming feeling that this this could be it, that these bodies that we exist in, right, this is the world that we know. Yeah. Not like the room that I'm looking at. I'm talking about the body, the yes. skin that I exist mm. in is the world that my spirit knows, mm. right? But you'll find that death could perhaps be Another. my spirit leaving and now it's, it's mature enough to go and enter into a different type of existence yes. because a baby now moves in a different type of existence mm-hmm. when they leave. And we could be actually in a uterus right now. Yeah. Do you get what the I'm saying? Yes. Like yes. We could be sitting yeah. in a womb right now. Yes. That's how much we don't know of like the what next. we're going mm-hmm. to elevate and, ex- and experience and like i said i'm somebody who believes in the known like you know i don't believe in the known, but like trust yeah known. i trust in the known mm-hmm. and like i'll have faith in the unknown yeah, yeah. but like you know what i see is what i know and for the first time i was like hmm perhaps that example alone is enough you know to really understand that we have no idea yes we have no idea what could find out that we're all siblings in a uterus right now do you get what I'm saying? Like, we absolutely have no idea what waits for us on the other side. And speaking, I know that you're somebody that definitely has huge faith in the, un- in the unknown, being somebody that communicates as well mm-hmm. with, um, like you said, communicating with, you know, yeah. How factual is it for you? That's what I want to get to. How factual is it for you? Is it known or are you believing in something that you don't see or do you feel like you know for a fact that they exist? The scientist in me, because uh-huh. I'm going to own that, yeah. is reminded constantly of this placebo effect of whether you take a drug and it works, 
even if it's a placebo, it's still working, right? Yeah. You're still sure. experiencing that. You're, it's mm. your reality. And so when I have experienced this communication or connection, sometimes it is in the flicker of a candle mm. or it's in a thought that you're having and the song comes on the radio that reminds you it's just the yes moment of mm. yes, you're with me, it's here, yeah, it's yeah, happening. Yes. Yeah. So how real is it? How tangible is it? How real is anything? Like you were saying, That's we could so be in the womb right now. You know your hands are there until mm. it's dark. Then you can't see your hands, but you still know they're there, right? Yeah. You still trust yeah. that your hands are there, even mm. though you can't see it mm. anymore. Mm. So to me, my experiences are real. And to other people, it's, it's bogus. It, it can't be. Mm. And that's completely fine. I don't feel I need to validate it. I hear you. You know? I, oh, I hear you. I yeah. remember one time I was crying, I was wailing, and I was about to share something that I never thought I'd ever share on a public platform. Because it's like, you know, I saw Bigfoot. <laughs> 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 but I remember I'm crying and I'm like, God, I just need to know actually that you exist. Yeah. And that I'm not praying out of vain. And show me something real quick that you're there. And... And I've never looked back since that day because something <laughs> happened and I was like, okay, you're here. Big <laughs> man is up there and this thing is real. And it actually, I, I can even share the, the full story. Like, uh, ugh, and it, like, once again, it's Bigfoot. It won't mean anything to anybody listening. You're just like, ursh. Because I remember sharing it with a friend and they were like, is that God? <laughs> <laughs> but I've got, my favorite flower is an arum lily, right? And I've been living here for, for a few years. Never seen an arum lily in my life. And something that people wouldn't generally know, that mm. that's my favorite flower. And I'm like, you know, God, show me. Show me that you're here, you're comforting me, and you exist. Right? And, I, and, and I've always said when I look at nature and I look at flowers, because for me, flowers are like God spoiling us. God is spoiling us with flowers. We Absolutely. Don't, you yeah. know, obviously, there's pollination and there's a necessity for them. But our eyes, I mean, they could have looked like cardboard boxes. But God said, let me spoil you guys. And so I've always had like a deep connection. Nature generally yeah. reminds you that God exists. And, yes. You know, nature, whether it's the water, something that just overwhelmingly so gloriously beautiful. Mm -hmm. It reminds you God is in nature, right? Mm -hmm. And so knowing my relationship with flowers and that specific flower, I walk out of my wailing session and this arum lily is in my garden. Never been there ever before. And it turns out the gardener planted it the year before. But it sprouted on that wow. day. Right? I mean, it is well, is but my friend God? was like, really? <laughs> no. The gardener just Your gardened. friend is a pessimist. Right. Please, that I is was clear. Like, God knew that a year from now, she's going to need this affirmation mm -hmm. that I'm here. I love her. I'm here to spoil her. Because that's why flowers for me, God is spoiling our eyes. I'm here to spoil you and love you and dote on you. And seeing that flower was a reminder that this is real. And mm -hmm. I've never looked back since. I can doubt many things. I yeah, really can yeah. doubt a lot of things. But from that instance, and it's that, it's that. Anybody else can say, oh, it's just a flower in a garden. I mean, it's a flower in a garden that was planted a year. Because I, I investigated. I'm like, where did this flower come from? <laughs> what is going on? And then eventually found out that the gardener says, oh, no, it was outside and outside. Then I brought it in and I thought you might mm. enjoy it. I did. And it just came out. I did yeah, enjoy it. You have no idea how much I enjoyed it, you know. And so that's always been, and like you're saying, there's certain experiences when you share them. To anybody else, it might seem like a trivial, but you know mm, mm. what is happening, flickering of a light. I, I've mm. never had any through But certain things that you just know, this is my personal experience. And it could be just your reality, Yeah. but it is what it is. Mm. The placebo is there. It's working. Something you said about doubt. Mm. Grief makes you doubt God, man. Yes. It really does because it becomes all you can think about. You cannot eat. You sure. cannot clean yourself. The natural functions of your liveliness are debilitated by this intense emotion. Mm -hmm. And so I have been in the place where I have doubted God, despite yeah. knowing that godliness, yeah. God and goddesses and all of them and none of them, yeah. the self that is God, the you that is God, the us that is God, that exists. But mm -hmm. grief makes you doubt that. Because how could anyone have to ugh, sit with this deep yeah. amount of pain and yeah. suffering? And it's yeah. God. It's God reminding you that all of the stuff that happens before grief is valid and necessary to feel this profound lack, mm. loss, mm. space for growth, space mm. for recreation, space to plant the flower mm. and watch it bloom. I'm always reminded of a storm in a forest, lightning hits the tree, the tree falls. It starts to decompose, mushrooms, maggots, things eat away at it. Yes, yes. And that breeds new life, mm. creates a little micro ecosystem it creates wood for fires. Mm. The wood that creates fires, you can take the charcoal, you can make drawings. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's just this 
continual cycle that is mm. not mm. as ephemeral as a flower, mm. but it is as beautiful continually. Yay. And it's just sometimes difficult when you're grieving to remind yourself it's part of it. It's mm. part of the process. Sure, it's very interesting to say. I remember I had a, an argument recently and... An argument? Yeah, I had an <laughs> argument. And then he says to me, uh, and I'm like, I'm, I'm really frustrated with this phrase that we had. Then he says, but it only exists because there's love. Mm. Like mm. it only exists. This pain and agony we're experiencing only oh exists God. because there's love. Absolutely. And sure. we cannot experience the love without experiencing that. So the duet, the collateral beauty mm. that runs hand in hand in life is something that, but it's a very difficult thing to explain. Especially, you know, with growing up, as a child, you're shielded. Right, you're shielded in the sense that, and it depends on the type of upbringing you have, but many children have a beautiful upbringing, are shielded. Mm. Your grandmother passes away and you just see many people, but nobody is explaining mm. what's happening. They're like, no, go play outside. So then it becomes a week where you got to play with your cousins, cousins mm. instead yeah. of understanding what grief is. And, and, then, and, and so that's why when you like, start picking up hints of it as you grow older, it's something that you need to deal with yourself because it's not something that... Uh, adults allow children to really experience and delve into, which is, I, I don't know whether it's a good or bad thing, but then it becomes, it becomes a thing that you need to learn alone, you know, or through your own experiences, no, maybe not necessarily alone, but through your own experiences, what it is to be experiencing collateral beauty, the beauty that goes with the hurt, mm. the, the beauty that goes with hurt and experiencing hurt, be it grieving a person, grieving a pet, grieving a job, grieving an opportunity, a business opportunity, grieving an income, you know, the, like I like that you said grieving those particular things because yeah. sometimes when we think about grieving, we think about it only in the form of losing a person. Mm. But there's so much grieving around dreams, goals, yes, jobs, and a relationships. Grieving, yeah. A grieving that can take so long. Mm. It can take so long to heal from not becoming a lawyer. Mm. It can take so long. It can take so long to heal from not finishing your your degree. Yes. And, and you find that some people wear that failure on their, I don't know what the saying is this in English. Is yeah, you wear it badge. like it, it comes to your sort of the thing that you carry with you for mm, so long. Mm, you, mm. you struggle to enter into a different space. I, I recently, it was such a pity, I saw it happening. I was chatting to this um, girl and and she was very vulnerable. And she, she said, you, you know, I'm standing through UNISA. I, I only just finished, uh, I didn't get to finish my degree and. And it was a beautiful, vulnerable asset. No, go for it. She says, yeah, as soon as I'm done, I want to start my honors degree immediately so that, you know, I don't, um, you know, uh, procrastinate even yeah, further. Mm -hmm. And I'm like encouraging her and it's great. And then she says, remind me, what do you do? And then I said, oh, no, I'm a lecturer. Uh, and then she goes, oh, that means you've studied quite a bit. Like she, she quickly adds up the numbers. And then I said, oh, no, I'm, you know, and I explain what I'm busy with and, you know, the degrees under my belt. And even as I'm saying it, it sounds very, but you know, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. telling the story. Yeah. And I immediately see this vulnerability disappear and her walls go up. And out of nowhere, she starts telling me how she manages a, a team of 15 people. And, and you oh. could see, like, the ego just needed to Whoa. rectify. Yeah. And it was such a pity. You mm. know? It was such a pity. I saw it happening and I was just like... I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I'm not was, there. It's not, we're not there. Yes. And, but I could see that this is an insecurity that she harbors mm -hmm. as she was sharing at first, that she's insecure, that she never finished her degree. Mm -hmm. And so I allowed her and to do it. And yet she's in these spaces. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I allowed her to do it because she needs to go through her own process. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be like, girl, relax. Nobody, you know, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. I couldn't do that. I needed her to go through her own little process. But it was such a pity. And I could see how this thing was such a big failure. She's grieving it still. Mm -hmm. She's achieved so much. I mean, she drives... A Mercedes Benz, like girl, I drive a Ford. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Ford, right? <laughs> you know, but you know, like it was just like this means nothing. Mm. But you could see how sometimes if we don't allow ourselves to grieve and forgive ourselves or, and move on yes. from certain hurdles yes. and see perhaps the we collateral even don't beauty, see the, the current beauty. Yes, yeah. we don't see the beauty so much so that we can carry these insecurities with us into the next phase. Mm. Oh, a bigger one. A bigger phase where you don't even see your own achievements yes. anymore. Mm. You don't see that you're doing so well. Mm. You know, the, the story becomes this grief that you never really mourned. Yeah. Mm. You know, and allowed to be like, okay, this hurt and it's time for me to move on. Mm. Anyway, I said a mouthful there. <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested. You're in neuroscience, ne? Yeah. But yeah. you also have this very liberated view on life and spirituality and so forth. How have you found the coexistence? Like... Because it seems like two different worlds. 
you know mm. but at, in the same breath i'm finding you find the relationship between these worlds so how has that existence happened coexistence um this is something that i grapple with constantly mm. i almost want to ask people that i look up to like do you do you feel this weird thing with science and spirituality yeah. and never wanting the two to meet because yeah. you don't want to be labeled as a pseudoscientist, yeah. right? I don't want anyone to look at me as a neuroscientist and think, nah, that man does not know what he's talking about yeah. because I have the spiritual yeah. side. But I Ooh. spoke to my honest supervisor about it and I said, how do you come to terms with a spiritual aspect of yourself and a scientific aspect. Okay, and he said, yeah. science is Maybe. spiritual. Oh, yes. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you are opening up little lens, quite mm. literally, if you're looking through a microscope or yeah. if you're looking at protein expression, the mm. genome, you are unraveling a little present that nature, God, mm. the universe, yourself, whatever you want, to. has given you. Yeah. Mm. And so it is spiritual to Ooh. have that inquisition in science, right? And to seek answers that's what scientists do we seek answers we humble ourselves mm. when we don't get them and mm. you learn these tricks about science that are adapted to your life like mm. be humble you know you're talking about ego and being a spiritual practitioner or whatever you want it to be being tapped into that part of yourself humbles you in science mm. True. because you remind yourself that you don't know everything mm. you are only peeking into the all-knowing stuff yes. around you yes. and mm. you want to engage with other people to share it and to be excited and I think when you lose that excitement that is when you lose the spiritual aspect of science when it just becomes a job mm. and when you no longer harbor the passion yes. to seek and oh, to inquire I love what you're saying right? it's crazy how because yeah. seek yeah. and inquiring is what you do yes. as an academic yes. yeah Absolutely. But you're also relating it to the spiritual realm that you're seeking and inquiring. Yes. Mm. And allowing yourself to see God in it. I mean, earlier we were speaking of uh, pregnancy. Mm. And, and, and and so Ness, Ness said, I should stop saying her name on this show. <laughs> but Ness said, you know, Ursh, when I was heavily pregnant, I could feel that this is a spiritual experience. And I said, it's because what's happening in your uterus is unknown. We all know something is happening. You're Ooh. right. It's unknown. Yeah. We all know, you know, and the science can break it down, down to like, um, Germany, fertilization, germination, you know, we, we all Selfie. know the embryology yes. of it and, and how it works. But at which point does yeah. the spirit come in? At which point does this person have a personality? At which point does this person develop thoughts and a mind and this and that? Like, that is unknown. The life part of it is unknown. Mm. Feelings, emotions, mm. all the things that we know that we cannot study, you know, and that in itself is a reminder to anybody who's in any field, actually, I get I don't even want to just give it to the science. Anybody who's yeah. willing to think and sit with anything, who allows themselves to sit and think about it, you can't deny that there is an unknown. Yeah. yeah. You and do you not know, know. When, when you speak of pregnancy, I feel like it's the one experience where doctors, like no one has really the say. It's mm. nature. And it's the unknown mm. that decides. Mm. No one. For me, weather is that a, a reminder like that. Yeah. yeah? Guys, it could just start raining. Yes. And then you know those things that, did you guys see any clouds? You know those days where there were no clouds in the sky? And you could have never guessed that yeah. today is going to be that day. The moon. like You can't miss it, guys. Oh, I love this conversation. Yeah. I don't know if you guys understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I love, I, I def I, yeah, I love speaking of spirituality. And it's, and it's a difficult one, like you're saying, because there's this betrayal because I'm somebody who likes to count the numbers. You know, tell me something, Lisi. I am that person who, if probably somebody had shared the flower story with me, I also would have been like... So even when you said my friend is a physicist, I'm like, girl, I am also a <laughs> It's just that the experience was happening to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually needed it to happen. Mm, mm. Because before that, you believe in God because it's a societal thing. You know, oh God, thank you so much for life. We thank you for food. But until you per you have an experience, it's a, it's a whole different level where you, you personally are like, no, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah i'm sure but i'm not sure but i'm sure <laughs> you know until that happens it's 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 nothing that you can really really deeply connect with and relate with but is it not happening constantly and you just need to oh, be yes. cracked open over to like over. see it and over feel it and yeah over. Yes. and we can enter into like religion but I, I definitely wouldn't want to trivialize it with anything like that like spirituality is what it is in the sense that it's either there's something else that there isn't for you. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. We can make like this thing about religion 
um, and I wouldn't want to do that because for me it's like you know we're all looking at this elephant those that believe is you're looking at an elephant at different angles you know so either you're seeing the tail or you're seeing the head or you're seeing for sure but we're all like really up close to if you if you allow yourself to believe mm. right and then and then but then it becomes a perspective that you have becomes this thing that you just believe in this part which is unfortunate it's just that there's something else you believe that there's something else anyway Oh, this was a ramble, but I loved it. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank for, you for coming Thank on. Thank you and, both. Yeah, and if you, I don't know if you want to share any parting words for somebody who is going through grief, who feels like we're trivializing what they're going through, <laughs> and they actually clicked on this episode because they felt like they needed help and they didn't feel like they necessarily got it. Do you have any sharing or parting words? I'll just sprinkle a little bit of science in before I move on. Yeah. Um, there is research that shows grieving is a type of relearning because it teaches you to relearn your association with the thing that you are grieving, the person you are grieving or relationship you are grieving, oh. the bits of yourself that you are That's grieving. It. Because when you think about it, your thought is it's no longer there. And so you are learning to think about it in a different way. Yeah. And so grieving is as much a part of life as anything. Mm -hmm. Just taking a breath in the morning or being able to open your eyes or walk around, look around, mm -hmm. touch things, smell things, feel things. Grief and loss is so much a part of that. And you are never alone. There is a bunch of really awesome websites. I'm thinking of SADAG, which is one of them, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. Reach out to people. It's okay to feel isolated and vulnerable and empty and you are never alone. Someone is willing mm. to hold space for you constantly. I am willing to hold space for you constantly mm. in as much capacity as I can. So grieve sure. fully, grieve completely. Don't hold back. Grieve in public. Grieve uglily. Mm. Uglily. Be ugly. <laughs> Cry. Mm. Feel it. Scream. Release. Mm. Don't think you have to grieve a certain type of way and don't let anyone tell you their steps. Grief is a cycle. Mm, it, sure. Years could go by and you mm. think, oh, I've done step one, two, three, four, five, six. Babes, no. It's going to start again constantly and, and it's every time. Hurt differently. Yes, mm, exactly. Sure. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. No. Yeah, I felt that yeah. one. I remember somebody saying, um, explaining that grief is like a ball and there's a circle around the ball and as the years go by, the circle gets bigger. But the ball, every time the ball hits is when it hurts. Oof. Yeah. And so at first, the ball is big enough, and the, I don't know if you guys can see what I'm trying to say, but basically there's a ball within a ball, and you, your healing is you growing bigger, so the ball hits fewer times, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So the hurt is fewer times, mm -hmm. but every time it hits, it hits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every time the pain comes, it comes, and it's as intense as the first time, but it's just less and less times over the years. And just thinking of it already for me is like a scary experience, because I know that I haven't necessarily grieved a human being very closely, and just that anxiety, but like... I need to learn now to be ready to look at it differently when it does happen because it's inevitable. Yeah. It will happen. And it's beautiful if you allow it to be. <sighs> it hey. is. Hey. And I hope that it's beautiful if you allow it to be. It didn't come across as insensitive and you just see our heart in this episode. And once again, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much to everybody for listening. It is the Conversation Capital. We're chatting all things to do with grief. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you so much. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. <laughs>